Next panel. Uh, title of this panel is called The Benghazi Betrayal. And as you hear them tell their story, you'll understand why we have that title. I'm going to bring up Charles Woods, father of Ty Woods, and Nick No, who worked for the military and uh, can tell you a lot about what was going on during that time. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Well, thank you. I appreciate your being here. Um, I hope that it's worth your wait. I'm sorry that we weren't able to do this sooner, but this will be worth your wait. I guarantee it. Um, I'm Ty Woods' uh, dad, and let me give you a little bit of background on our family. When Ty was five years old, we uh, moved to a 9,000-acre ranch in Long Creek, Oregon, and that, that was one of the things that made him a Navy SEAL. He would take out his uh, single shot 22 and a box of shells, and he'd be gone shooting ground squirrels. And uh, uh, we have horses. He'd go hunting. He absolutely loved that life. He was very adventurous. And uh, as soon as he graduated from high school, he said, I'm going into the Navy, not just to bring the barnacles off the bottom of the ship, but to be a Navy SEAL. And that's what he did. For 20 years, he was a Navy SEAL. He retired. But once you're a Navy SEAL, you're always a Navy SEAL. He didn't have to, but every so often they'd call him up because of his skills. And uh, I'd get a phone call and they'd say, well, Dad, I'm leaving in about an hour. I can't tell you where I'm going or when I'm coming back. And uh, the last time I talked to him, I received a phone call. And he had a brand new baby that was just a couple days old. And he said, uh, Dad, I'm going to be leaving on a business trip to the Middle East. And I said, Ty, you know, for the, the time that you were in there for 20 years, I never worried about your safety, but I did pray that you'd be protected. Now, when you become a Navy SEAL, they put you in a room, and they say one out of every three of you is going to die, and they still accept the assignment, okay? He was fortunate. The only thing that really happened to him, he was in a boat wreck one night running without lights, and he separated both shoulders. That was it, okay? And uh, I said, Ty, if there's any way you can get out of this, do. do. I don't know why I, I said that. I just felt that's what I was supposed to say. And he said, well, don't said, worry, well, don't Dad. Worry, I can't tell you who I'm working for. You know who she, her name was. And uh, he says, they never like to lose anyone. And I said, well, if there's any way that you can get out, do. OK? He was actually supposed to come home in August. This didn't happen until September. But you know, I'd taken him so many times hunting that there was one of the people that he was stationed with. His dad was from Washington, and they had archery season for elk. Any of you hunters know what that's like. You don't miss archery hunting for elk. That was in August. And so Ty said, oh, don't worry. Hey, you go spend time with your dad hunting elk. And I've done that enough times. You do it. He says, I'll take your place. He was supposed to come home six days after 9-11. And he'd already told them, he says, This is absolutely the last time I'm going to take one of these assignments. OK? I got a phone call from the dad of that young man that he took the place of. And he says, my son is really having a hard time Tony. living with himself. Because I think he we thinks can use the picture any time. That's who he's talking about. Rather than Ty that went home to be with the Lord. And I said, don't worry about it. I said, not one sparrow falls on the ground outside of God's will. Right? Right. Okay. And I said, because of that, it was Ty's time to go. Each one of you guys have been in car wrecks and things like that where you shouldn't be here today. So you know that for a fact. It will probably, I don't know how many times, Ty was probably in worse situations than in Benghazi, but it was not his time. Okay? And so I know where Ty's at. And I want to see him one of these days, OK? But I also know that if I don't forgive everyone, I'm not going to be there. You know, think about the Lord's Prayer. What does it say? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. And right after the amen, the next sentence is, if you do not forgive others, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. So really, I hate to say it, I, I don't have any 
hard feelings towards anyone, either in Washington, D.C., or over in some other country. I don't. In fact, actually, people have come up and said to me, hey, I wish so-and-so was burning in hell or something like that. And I said, no. I would love to see Obama, Hillary, all those people responsible for his death. I would love to see them in heaven. Obviously, they'd kind of have to change the direction they're going. But I, I would love to see him up there. I, I'd be one of the first people to give him a hug. And I've said, hey, I'm glad you finally made it. OK? So anyway. That's made it so much easier for me to live with the death of my son. OK. But right after that, we were called up by Fox News. And they wanted us to go on. And I said, OK, I'll do it on one condition, that we don't make this political. I'll go on, but just the program's just going to be to honor Ty. And so what I did was I took Ty's brother, that'd be his half-brother. Uh, I think we have a video that, or a picture. Picture go, picture go. Okay, Thank can you. you tell which one's Ty? Can you tell which one's Jeremiah's brother? Ty's the one with the rifle. But both of them are in the Navy. Ty was a Navy SEAL for 20 years. Immediately after this, Jeremiah, I'm so proud of him, he called up the Navy and he said, I want to take my brother's place. He had a college scholarship for sports. And so obviously being a SEAL would be no big deal for him. And when they found out he was a pre-med major, they said, you're more valuable to us as soon as you get in med school, sign up for 12 years. He's a lieutenant in the Navy. He actually met with Buds so that he can take his medical rotation in March with the Buds. There's a few steals that have become doctors, but it usually doesn't work the other way of the doctor becoming a SEAL. Our family, we don't we go forward. We're fighters. So what happened was we went on Hannity, and I took uh, Jeremiah so people could see. You can tell, sort of looks like his brother. I guess it's uh, a recessive gene that obviously skipped a generation. <laughs> but I also took his two sisters. and. <laughs> They were young. The youngest one was like seventh grade. And they were just supposed to be there so that people could visualize, OK, this is what Ty looked like. This is what his family would look like. So they could relate to him. So it just wouldn't be a number. So it would be real. And so it could honor Ty. And they weren't supposed to say anything. But I'd got a lot of static from my view on forgiveness. Because people would say, hey, it's people like you that forgive that never get anything done. And so Sean. He popped this question, and he says, I have two kids, and if someone killed one of my children, I don't think that I could forgive like your father has. And then ask my two young daughters, who weren't supposed to say anything, the question, how do you feel about your dad's stance on forgiveness? Now, my wife is an intercessor. She is a prayer warrior. She's praying right now that God will put the right words in our mouths. At that time, she was praying that God would do the same thing, that she'd put the right words in my kid's mouth. So the first daughter smiled, just lit up the whole studio, and this is what she said. She said, Jesus was pretty good at forgiving people. And then he... I'm, I've been blessed with such a wonderful family, really. And then asked my other daughter, same question. And she just smiled, <laughs> radiated the love of Jesus, and said, and we're supposed to be like Jesus. OK, I always, I always wondered, you know, here you had several million people watching. OK, I knew, what does it say in Romans 8.28? Anyone know that one? All things work towards good if you love God and fit into God's purpose, okay? 
I knew some good was going to come out of this for our country, and then hopefully spiritually as well, to honor God. And I always wondered if because of what the kids said to several million people, maybe if only one of them decided to accept the reality of Christ, it would be more than worth it, okay? Two years ago, I was at a New Year's Eve party over in Hawaii, where we live, obviously, and there was one person there that knew more about Benghazi than anyone I'd practically ever talked to. And uh, her husband had died that previous year, and he was a businessman. They were very successful. They had a 2,000-acre horse ranch, and I don't mean saddle horses, I mean racing thoroughbreds. And uh, he was, he'd gone to church, and she said, but he really wasn't a Christian. But when he does business, he doesn't trust anyone until there's a show me moment, and then he trusts the person. After watching that, and the response of my daughters, he turned to his wife and he said, that was the show me moment. Now I believe. And then she said, because of what your daughter said, because of Ty's death, my husband died six months ago, and he's in heaven right now. So what we're talking about, the reality of Romans 8.28, look it up. Good things do happen spiritually. Okay? Good things happen to our country. Can you think of one good thing that might have happened to our country because of the sacrifice that people made in Benghazi? I can think of one thing. Okay, usually when you cover up something, one of the ways you do it is by the passage of time. People forget about it. After about a week or a couple of days or a little bit of time, people forget about it. Four years later, what started off as a snowball ended up being an avalanche right before the election in 2016. You know what happened. If it hadn't been for the sacrifices that were made in Benghazi, if it hadn't been for the blood that was shed there, there wouldn't have been the crooked Hillary, there wouldn't have been the Benghazi emails, there wouldn't have been the 30,000 emails that were erased, but they were captured, okay? And there wouldn't have been the FBI report right before the election. That was enough to push it over the other side and prevent our country from becoming, you know what, a totalitarian socialist government. That's the goal of globalism. So like I say, good things have happened as a result of this. And I'm looking forward. Well, my view is this. Okay, with Ty, we're just experiencing about a 30-year interruption in our relationship. But one of these days when I see Ty, I want him to say, hey, Dad, I'm proud of you. You did what I would have done. No, just, hey, I'm just doing my job. No, seriously, guys. Someone want this. Okay, I didn't know anything about the military hardware that was available at the time, but I knew that there should have been a rescue, and I didn't know why. So what I did is I wrote a letter to President Obama, and I asked him this question. I said, if one of your family members had been in Benghazi, would you have done things any differently? And President Obama, he was gracious enough to uh, write a letter to me. This is a copy. That's his signature right there. And uh, he made four basic statements that we're going to look at right now. The first one, quote, U.S. forces could not arrive in time. Well, I didn't have any military evidence to the contrary, so no, I guess he's telling the truth. Number two, he said military forces were not close enough Okay, well, they knew there was going to be an attack. I, someone who was in the building, Ty was on the roof, before he was killed, he made one last deal down there and he talked to this particular individual. He called me twice 
and he said the day before the attack, Ty had the skills of an emergency room doctor. He was a medic as well as the other skills. And the day before, he got everyone together, and he says, we're probably going to be attacked tomorrow. And he got out the ketchup bottle. He got out the medical equipment, the gauze. He got out the tourniquets and had people practice on each other, squirting the ketchup, putting tourniquets on, packing gauze. They knew there was going to be an attack. And Washington, D.C. knew there was going to be an attack. OK, so when they say forces weren't close enough, they knew there was going to be an attack the next day. I would have pre-positioned assets. There were drones litter, well, I found out later, Nick will confirm this, there were drones littering the sky. OK, technically, they're supposed to be unarmed, but everyone knows that they aren't. They're equipped with Hellfire missiles. Now, a Hellfire missile can hit a target three feet. There were so many of them up above that if I had been sitting in the Situation Room in the White House, and I had the authority that our Commander Chief has, I would have just said, OK, one of those drones, put one of those Hellfire missiles right in the front yard of the embassy right now, and guess what would have happened? Those terrorists, they would have been running for their lives. They wouldn't have even got as far as where Ambassador Stevens was. That wasn't done. In fact, actually, the battle lasted 13 hours. Not one thing was done in 13 hours. But, you know, he said it, so I guess we're supposed to believe it. Okay, number three. I directed my national security team to do everything possible. What? Well, Nick, he pointed out to me, it wasn't what you're really thinking about. What he was actually saying was, I did everything possible to make sure everyone died in Benghazi. Ask yourself why. I don't know the answer to that. OK? But it sure wasn't I didn't do everything possible to rescue. Because for 13 hours, there was nothing done to rescue. In fact, Nick's going to tell you they were ordered, do not rescue. OK? The fourth thing, I know, when I found this out, my actions would have been the same if the attack had been against a member of my own family, end of quote. How many of you would want to be one of Obama's kids? I wouldn't want to be. Because guess what? If I was commander in chief and I was sitting in the situation room watching one of my family members or a family member of someone that was my job to protect, because we, as our, we don't leave our military people behind. We always rescue. OK, that's what we do. I wouldn't have gone upstairs and got rested up so I could go collect money the next day in Las Vegas. I couldn't have gone to sleep knowing that one of my family members or someone else's family member was going to be killed. I couldn't have done that. I'm a family man. And I'm sure you are. And I bet you there's not one family person here that could have gone to sleep with a good conscience, knowing that all you had to do was say the word, and they would have been rescued. OK, like I say, I don't have any military knowledge of what assets were available. But about a year and a half ago, I had an interview with Dave Janda, Dr. Dave Janda, Fantastic. OK, he is, OK, J-A-N-D-A. -A. Look him up, listen to him. OK, he worked in the White House for years, way back in the Reagan time. So he's got a lot of contacts in the White House. And sometimes they even feed him information ahead of time to let the public know. He is a tremendous patriot. Well, after the interview, he said, if there's any military people out there, that know why there wasn't a rescue, please contact Mr. Woods a year and a half ago. Several military people whose job it was to rescue contacted me. OK, now AFRICOM and CENTCOM, they have two places of operation. And in those places, one of their jobs is to send out rescue teams 
on short notice to be ready 24 hours a day, okay? There's one in Tampa, and there's one in Randstein, Germany. The one in Tampa, they must have known there was gonna be an attack because at the time of the attack, they had a meaningless exercise called forward look going on. The people that were conducting that were complaining. Hey, we need to cut short this exercise because there's people that might be dying in Benghazi. And guess what? They didn't stop the exercise. It was totally meaningless. Finally, it ended eight and a half hours later. And when it ended, did they rescue? No. You know what they were told? They were told, we're not supposed to do anything because we were ordered. The State Department is in control of Benghazi. Now, I don't know a whole lot. I'm just a stupid attorney. But I do know that the military does not take orders from the Secretary of State. That's right. The military takes orders from the Commander-in-Chief. That's President Obama, unless the Commander-in-Chief tells the military concerning Obama, or I'm sorry, concerning Benghazi, don't obey me, obey Secretary of State Clinton. Okay, I was shocked when I found that out. Okay, now Nick, he worked in Ramstein, Germany, and one of the many jobs that they had there was to know where all the military assets are and to be able to send to northern Africa and the near Middle East, rescue teams available 24 hours a day. I'd like to introduce to you my friend, Nick No. Oh, here, there we Thank go. You. Those are the four points. Yeah. He'll toss so, it to video so, at some point. Thanks for coming. So in regards to the letter that Barack Obama sent to Charles Woods and his statement Copy. said, U.S. forces could not arrive in time. That's absolutely not true. Absolutely not true at all. Uh, we actually, uh, as in my position I was at in combat operations there at the 603rd AOC, uh, I had several different assets, basically all the assets for Africa all send uh, information to me, and then from there I would consolidate that information, and I would make reports for generals, and I would send out situation reports. And one of those, one of those uh, units was a rescue team, and they, as Charles said, they were ready to go 24 hours a day. And during the time of the attacks, they were not asked to help at all. As a matter of fact, I've got more information. Let me tell you more about it. So during that time, NATO was in the area. Okay, NATO was nearby and they requested us, they specifically requested to CENTCOM and asked, can we help you in this situation? Can we help you? And we denied them uh, and told them no. On top of that, as Charles said, we had drones armed and unarmed littered all over Northern Africa. And it, even if there wasn't an, an, uh, an armed drone right in that spot. It could be there in a very short time. And we also had enough Marines to invade the country in Rota, Spain, nearby. It would have only taken a couple hours to get over there, and problem solved. And also, Aviano has fighter jets, right? And they were also running an exercise at the same time, and they were told not to leave the exercise that they were in and engage and uh, provide close air support. So to address the second question, or second statement, the attacks happened so rapidly that forces could not arrive in time. For one whole week before the attacks, they had received indications of warnings letting them know that the attacks were gonna happen, all right? And then on top of that, there were over 600 requests for more security, and all of those requests were denied. And that was over the course of a few months. So do the math, that's over two times a day. Two times. So the other statement that's really peculiar 
out of all of them is that he instructed his national security team to do everything possible. That is bullshit, all right? Yeah. Now, if that was true, he would have told, they would have told the people at CENTCOM to stop their exercise and engage and provide support in a rescue team, all right? Instead, they're told the State Department <clears throat> is in control and to continue on their exercise for another eight and a half hours. The State Department doesn't have any assets, all right? They don't, they don't have any assets to do anything. The military doesn't take orders from the State Department. They're not involved in the chain of command at all. So Obama was somewhat accurate in what he said. Obama did tell his national security team to do everything possible, and it was to ensure that everyone in Benghazi died. Now, there's a saying in Washington that the cover-up is worse than the crime. And in this case, it's no exception. Hillary, Clint Hillary Clinton was selling weapons through Benghazi. There was a covert weapons program ran through the CIA through Mark Turry. Mark Turry was only allowed to give small arms weapons and, uh, and provide them through Benghazi. And Hillary personally told him, no, you're not doing that anymore, I am. And then her and her friends decided to sell all the weapons through Benghazi. And among those weapons, that they sold through there were Stinger missiles. And these Stinger missiles all went through Benghazi and went to our enemies. These Stinger missiles can shoot down a jetliner. A 12-year-old can be shown how to put it on their shoulder, point it, and pull, pull the trigger and hit, shoot down a jetliner. That's how sophisticated these weapons are, all right? So along the way, those weapons made it in the hands of a few very bad people. Actually, most of them went to bad people. And one of these missiles made it over to Afghanistan. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the fact that the SEAL Team 6, after they killed bin Laden, they were all killed. Almost all of them were killed very shortly after. Joe Biden said publicly that SEAL Team 6 had actually completed the mission. After that, they began re rewriting their wills per their a Gold Star family member. They knew what would happen. They weren't going to go home. That's right. So one of these missiles made it to Afghanistan, and it was used to shoot down their helicopter. It's Extortion 17 is how some people might know it as. All right? So when they, shoot, when they shot down this helicopter and killed nearly all of them, it makes you wonder, why did this all happen? You know, after you know, talking with Charles, I've, I've come in contact with several witnesses. I've gotten so much information from so many people. And one of the main questions that I could never answer was why. Why would they do this, right? Why would you do this? Not, there's got to be more, than, more motivation than the fact that they're just evil. So we're going to show to you what we found about February of last year. I came in contact with Stand by roll. with very good information. This should be video 789, Benghazi News. All right. Go ahead and roll with the roll. Hey, good morning, Alan. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Good morning, Nick, and uh, uh, great to be here. Please introduce yourself to everybody, your full okay, name. I'm, uh, my name's Alan Perot. I was a uh, falconer for Arab political leaders for 20 years, and then I spent another 10 years in former Soviet territories uh, doing conservation work and catching falcon smugglers. Excellent. So, in our we crossed paths about a year ago, or no, about you know, eight months ago, and 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 I have always been searching for the reasons as to why 
and why they wanted everyone to die in Benghazi. And boy, do you have some really good information that explains everything. And uh, you know, I, I we appreciate that you're taking the time to share it with us, everyone. So, thank you. Uh, well, I, I have to say that that our military are so well trained; their work is compartmentalized, and the only people that understand the full story are the people at the top. Uh, and they have made some very bad decisions for this country and uh, for uh, the former Navy SEAL Ty Woods and his brethren who perished unnecessarily uh, at the hands of Hillary Clinton. And uh, uh, in the large picture, this involves Joe Biden and John Brennan. So could you ex explain the context of how all this, how did this all start? Well, the, the, the gestation, the beginning was uh, in the 70s during the Church Commission uh, when an alternate CIA was created called the Safari Club. And the Safari Club was financed by overseas allies. Uh, it was outsourced to foreign banks. I have uh, two banks and bank accounts that were used by the Safari Club and the individuals with checks paid out by them. Osama bin Laden was one of the recipients of funding from this uh, alternate CIA that was uh, subverting the oversight control of the successor to the uh, Church Commission, and that is the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, uh, one week before bin Laden was killed, I was called down to the Senate Intelligence Committee to give uh, statements and evidence. And I have uh, quite a few tape recordings and uh, uh, of, of uh, senior members uh, who were aware of bin Laden's house arrest in Iran for 10 years following Tora Bora. This was arranged by John Brennan. This is why Gary Bernson was not allowed to kill um, Osama bin Laden in Tora Bora when he was only a few hundred yards away uh, because the plans had been made and set in stone by John Brennan to uh, extradite uh, bin Laden from Tora Bora to Iran, where he remained under house arrest for 10 years with 100, more than 100 Al Qaeda leaders and their families. So, what you're saying is that there was no need for us to invade Afghanistan under the pretext of getting Al Qaeda if the US government knew and was actually protecting his life in Iran. Is that correct? Well, I have to say it really, it, it was rogue elements of the US government controlled by uh, John Brennan, Richard Clark, uh, uh, Vice President Biden, quite a, quite a few people. There's a long list of, of people. Uh, they started with good intentions. The Safari Club was begun to, to fight the expansion of the USSR, but it turned into a, um, a, a very distorted operation over the years. And uh, Osama bin Laden was the figurehead uh, manifestation of this alternate CIA. And so they had to protect him in their bad judgment. And you see, one lie leads to another. Our parents always taught us this. And so uh, when I, uh, my team, we, we planned a program to go in and get bin Laden in Iran. Uh, we were going to catch him when he was falconry hunting because I spent 20 years living with Arab political leaders, training their falcons and going out in, in these camps, hunting with them. And then uh, I noticed there were terrorists coming into these camps and the Royal Falconry camps are Al Qaeda's boardroom. This is where these bad guys come. There are no passport or border controls. And, and so uh, uh, we, we were gonna go in and get Bin Laden, but unfortunately within minutes of ascending to the office of the CIA director, Leon Panetta's first act in office was to cancel the RIGOR program, R-I-G-O-R, -R, a covert CIA program to catch 
and kill Osama bin Laden in Iran. Uh, this was six months after Barack Obama was sworn in as president and Leon Panetta threw a tantrum and canceled rigor. This was reported by Goldman and Apuzo and slightly mischaracterized in the press as targeting Al Qaeda leaders all over the world, but it was focused only on Iran and bin Laden. And so um, uh, when we were first ignored and then obstructed and then threatened by eight CIA officials and warned off going into Iran to get bin Laden. We had passports, visas, uh, everything was ready. The, the revolutionary guards were gonna be our bodyguards while we were out doing uh, bona fide scientific research as a cover for catching bin Laden alive for delivery to a tri-state area. Uh, when we were shut down by Leon Panetta and others, uh, I began negotiating directly uh, with Iran, six scenario analyses for the transfer of bin Laden alive and well to coalition uh, forces and uh, to have him put in a neutral zone. Um, and Iran is on tape agreeing to this, it was all done. It took three years to develop this. I had meetings in the Iranian mission at the United Nations, Ambassador Mohammed Kazai organized everything. Bak Sarai was, was the handler. There were several handlers, everything was ready. And then I went to um, Governor Bill Richardson, New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson on December 2nd and 3rd of 2010. He agreed to be the US envoy to receive bin Laden for a transfer to coalition custody. And uh, it turned out that bin Laden had already been moved to Abbottabad, Pakistan in August of 2010. And, uh, um, and so- Why was uh, he transferred there? He was transferred there because in the six scenario analyses that I discussed with Iran by harboring Osama bin Laden and a hundred Al Qaeda leaders, this represents an act of war against the United States. Their nuclear facilities could be bombed and their economy obliterated. So the time moves backwards instead of forwards. And the Iranians didn't want to risk exposing their, their uh, complicit, uh, or, complicity with John Brennan and others to harbor. You see, they, John Brennan and Clinton and Biden outsourced the imprisonment of Al Qaeda leaders to Iran. We think of outsourcing as, as being a commercial activity. They outsourced our military responsibilities to an untrustworthy adversary, Iran. And, and they did that to save Iran from retaliation for harboring uh, terrorists. And so Iran had no choice in their estimation, but to accept the offer of Clinton in lieu, oh, in lieu of my, over my offer, which was transferred to a neutral zone because that would have endangered their economy and their nuclear program. And so they Clinton, could, forgive me, uh, I, I wanna ask you about this. So Clinton actually knew about this, right? You, she knew the, that they were willing to just hand him over to us. Tapes, and, registered letters, everything to Clinton. And, so, and so she knew that they were ready, Iran was ready to give us bin Laden with no real struggle. And absolutely. She, so she decided to have him move to Pakistan for yes. a trophy kill. For they, they moved him to Abbottabad in August of 2010. And uh, that's our first overhead viewings of bin Laden walking in the garden. Everybody said he was crippled, but he walked down three flights of stairs to walk in a garden to advertise his presence, okay? It was an advertisement. Then the gas line was put on the third floor of the Abbottabad complex in August because he, his wives had to stay uh, sequestered away from the other men. They had to cook in private without the purda veil. And uh, other things, uh, Saad bin, uh, one of bin Laden's sons said his father was strangely resigned to dying in Abbottabad. So he was held there in a gilded cage, awaiting his trophy kill. He was moved from Mashhad, Iran, into Abbottabad uh, airport, and then moved to this prison complex, the Abbottabad compound. It was not there to protect him. It was there to keep him there, awaiting his appointment with destiny. But the Iranians turned it into a fateful result.
because they pulled bin Laden out at the last minute, at the 11th hour, after an Iranian agent, a double agent, a Pakistan ISI officer who worked for Iran covertly, provided the DNA evidence uh, to the CIA station chief. Uh, finally, they were convinced it was bin Laden in Abbottabad and they sent in SEAL Team 6. And uh, Musharraf said he didn't know about the SEAL Team 6 coming in, but they had to let down the radar long enough for the helicopters to come in. And they only told Obama about the uh, SEAL Team 6 kill mission after the radar was put back up and SEAL Team 6 could not go back into uh, Pakistan, Af Afghanistan. It was then a one-way trip that could not be canceled. You see, we have, we have a witness who, who witnessed uh, Hillary and Panetta threatening Obama that if he didn't green light the bin Laden kill mission, they would expose him in the press and he would never survive politically. And he actually was reluctant to authorize the kill mission. That's why they pulled him off the golf course only after the mission could not be canceled. And uh, so the, the Asian provocateurs, the engineers of all of this were John Brennan, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden. And uh, uh, when, they, when they went in there trusting the Iranians had, had, had bin Laden there waiting for them, SEAL Team 6, your son. They, well, he, was, he was retired at that time. Actually. Yes, but, but the SEAL Team 6, they killed Osama bin Laden's double. How do we know that? One of the wives went running towards them before he shot him and said, don't shoot, he's, he's a double. I don't know the language she used. And uh, then uh, if you read uh, Cy, Hirsch, uh, Cy Hirsch's book, um, he explains that they threw the body parts over the Hindu Kush mountains. They didn't even save them like they saved the sons of Saddam Hussein in, in a refrigerated tent, well-preserved and with makeup, just to prove that they that the wicked witch was dead. They saved the sons of Saddam Hussein, but they did not save the corpse of Osama bin Laden because it was his double. And so, it, could not, it could not handle the scrutiny of DNA testing. Okay, so the SEAL team, they knew that? That it was thrown out of the helicopter. They learned that it. They learned that it was not Bin Laden, and so they threw the body parts over the Hindu Kush mountains. and And uh, John Brennan said that the uh, people on the ship were told to keep quiet about the barrel at sea, but they all say that they never were told to keep quiet because there was no barrel at sea. John Brennan took the lead and made the fake media announcements. He lied to the press when he explained this. This Muslim burial at sea, it's, it's actually haram. It's forbidden to bury a Muslim at sea unless, unless the body's gonna endanger the lives of the crew with disease risk. You know, you can't, because you see in the ocean, the feet, it'll rotate around and the feet will face Mecca, it's haram. You must bury on land with the face facing Mecca. So Brennan, who, who's a Muslim, you'd think he'd know not to lie about something so obvious. He said it was a Muslim burial at sea, nonsense. And, uh, so this big lie uh, that you, you see, they, Biden, Hillary, and Clinton worked this agreement with Iran. They trusted Iran to move bin Laden to Pakistan. He did. He was there. But then they trusted Iran to keep him there. They moved him out back to Iran. And then uh, the communication from Iran to Obama was, hey, uh, we got your neck in a noose. Give us a give us all this money, hundred and fifty two billion dollars. Two billion on an airplane pallet was paid out for the secrets I wish to reveal now and to the president under the terms of misprision and treason. That is to say, this is a secret. These are secrets worth one hundred and fifty two billion dollars paid by President Obama and Vice President Biden paid with the blood of SEAL Team 6 when he had them killed. So it's blackmail and extortion then. Blackmail and extortion. Now, do Iran you, commandeered. We have the documents to prove uh, to yes. this. Yes. Now, if, Iran, yes, sir? Well, I was going to ask you, if you have those documents, are you willing to personally deliver those to President Trump 
if he were to provide the transportation and the guarantee of safety for you to do that? Well, I'm not concerned about safety. There's always an invisible hand that protects us and we're on the winning team. America's on the winning team. Not one sparrow falls to the ground outside of God's will. Yes. yes. Uh, I, it would be my pleasure and my honor to bring this material to President Trump. There's a massive amount, terabytes, documents, video, audio. I it needs to go to the president. Yes, I will sir. do everything that I can to get this video in his hands. It's well, my only wish. Alan, I've got a my question for wish. you. Um, so that means that SEAL Team 6 was shot down on purpose after the, the trophy kill to ensure that no dead man can tell no tales. You were correct. So that uh, President Obama paid bribery of $152 million. Vice President Biden paid with the blood of SEAL Team 6. He spent their blood like currency. Well, I've got, to, I've got to share something with you. Actually, Charles does. Charles, tell him about the Army Ranger that you talked to that was in the city where uh, they were shot down. Okay. Uh, when I, we lived in Hawaii and for about a month afterwards, I was in shock and my wife and I, we went walking on the beach and in the back of my vehicle, I have a, a bumper sticker about Thai and this gentleman came up to me and he was an army ranger that had been injured and he was recuperating in Hawaii. And he said, how do you know? Chief Petty Officer Woods. And I says, well, I'm his dad. And he says, well, I worked with your son. And we became very close. It was part of my healing process, actually getting to know him. Uh, he started coming to our church. His girlfriend started surfing with my daughters and they ended up getting married. Uh, and one of the things that he told me, he says, I was on the ranger team that was in that village where SEAL Team 6 was killed. The story was by the Biden-Obama administration that uh, there was this team that was under attack in this village. Uh, we're going to die if you don't get someone here really quick. And so they loaded SEAL Team 6 on this slow, vintage Huey helicopter the size of a school bus and slowly got them to the village. Now, they did not request help. They've been in that village numerous times before. In fact, if someone came, it would actually endanger them. The story was not true. And then usually when a helicopter comes in, it goes zoom right down to the ground, opens up, all the troops go out in seconds, and then boom, the helicopter goes straight up. Well, this was a sitting target, okay, the size of a school bus. It hovered in the air over that village just waiting to be shot down. And the people hot roped, I've never heard the word, word hot rope before. That means they each individually lowers down while it was a sitting target. And then apparently it was shot down by one of those weapons that Hillary Clinton illegally sent to Benghazi to give to terrorists, a terrorist organization the US government used to get rid of our ally who was fighting terrorism, that's Gaddafi. One of, one of the and then that, been, end, that weapon ended up over in Afghanistan. They were Stinger missiles, thousands upon thousands of them went missing. And Mark Turry was told that he's no longer, he had a small arms uh, covert weapons program going. So that way there, none of that was ever given to someone because they could shoot down jetliners just flying by if they wanted to. A child could do it and a 12 year old could do it. So these Stinger missiles, went through Benghazi and then were given to the people who shot down SEAL Team 6. That was a setup. They were covering their tracks there. And then when they found the serial number on one of the missiles is traced back to the CIA from Qatar, from that weapons cacher of Stinger missiles. That's why they had to then cover their tracks after people found out that the missiles were from uh, Qatar and then they could trace back where they came from 
from Hillary through Benghazi. That's why Stevens was back there to recover those missiles and 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 uh, cover up the evidence. Well, that's the least way he was told. Um, you know, I assume that part of the plan for her was to eliminate everyone there at the Benghazi uh, compound as well. You, you know, it's just so wicked. It's it's hard. It's just so unimaginably evil what these people do. Dead men don't talk. Well, well, Alan, you we'll, have to, we'll talk. We will talk. You have some good news coming up here in the next week and a half. Week. Yes, sir. It's going to be released. Uh, audio tapes, documents. Uh, I believe so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing about it and uh, seeing seeing everybody connect the dots because it's pretty plain to see the people involved and it's all connected to another crime spree and, and that's another story though. Well, let's just remember that heavy price has been paid for the secrets we are uncovering and there are millions of people who want to see the truth. And we're going to, we're going to deliver. Well, America is a democracy and for a democracy to work, the people that vote need to know what the truth is. And that is why we have three weeks for the people of the United States to get to know the truth. I hope that the media covers this, including the fake media, because the truth has to come out for our democracy to work properly so people can vote intelligently. Totally agree. I agree. All right, Alan, uh, we appreciate your time today. I'm sure this is just the beginning and we look forward to hearing and, and seeing uh, what you're going to show to everyone in the future. It's the beginning, but it's also the beginning of the end for the bad guys. Woo <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it comes out. Speak to you soon. Yes, yes, sir. Have a good day, Alan. Always a pleasure to meet you. Yes, yes. Thank Lord you. bless. Bye yes. bye. Yes, the whole yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. I mean, did you have any in person briefings? I don't find it funny at all. Okay. The Lights death go. of my son. The death of SEAL Team 6 is no laughing matter. I don't know. <laughs> Hillary Clinton and the rest of them may take it lightly. They may think it's a laughing matter. I don't. Things need to be changed. I don't know how we're going to do it. But this video needs to go viral. Yes. This video needs to get in. Yes. Why? Because if he can do in one hour or less at the embassy in Baghdad, guess what? He can do with this. I don't know how we're going to do it, but this video needs to be in the hands of our president, President Trump. And we only have three weeks. Immediately. How do you do it? How to get it there? Get it there. If you guys can make this go viral, make it go viral. Yeah. I just want you to know there's a lot of new information here, but we've tried to confirm everything. What Nick said, we've confirmed that. What he said, that was confirmed when I met the Ranger, who basically said the same story, that that was a setup, that the blood of SEAL Team 6, that was currency that was spent by Joe Biden, by Hillary Clinton, and by President Obama. That is not right. That's not what our leaders should do. Our military protects our leaders. Our leaders should protect our military. Yes, that's right. I hope you think that it was worth staying in the water yes. again. Oh. Thank you. I just encourage you guys, anything you can do to get this video out, viral and to the president, please do it. Thank you very much.